In the early 1920s, Soviet authorities held a demonstration action. They put dissident philosophers, scientists, university professors, and other alien intelligentsia on steamships and trains and sent them from the USSR to Europe. Without the right to return to their homeland under threat of execution, this large-scale campaign has received the collective and symbolic name, Philosophical Steamer, among historians. In the last couple of years, there have been more and more people in Russia who want to reconsider their attitude towards it. It all started with the fact that in May 1922, in one of his articles, Lenin attacked the church, the intelligentsia, and the bourgeoisie, including the editorial board of The Economist magazine, in whose person he condemned the dissenting scientific and cultural elite as a whole. At the end of the article, Ilyich summarized that such people should be politely sent to countries of bourgeois, democracy, Lenin put this word in quotation marks. Having understood the opaque hint of the leader, subordinates at all levels of the proletarian government looked at the intelligentsia with a contemptuous Leninist squint. And the Central Executive Committee, at Lenin's personal request, quickly added an article to the new criminal code of the RS Fessar on the possibility of expelling counter-revolutionaries from the country. The article, Propaganda and Agitation, appeared in the criminal code published very soon, the punishment for which was imprisonment or expulsion from the country. At the same time, according to the criminal code, the convicted person should have been shot for unauthorized return to his homeland. Following Lenin, the topic of deportation of dissidents was raised in the press by Leon Trotsky using the example of literary critic Julius Eichenwald. In the article, Dictatorship, Where's Your Whip? Trotsky called Eichenwald garbage and dishwashing detergent and called for using this whip to force the literary critic to leave the camp of contentment, in other words, to go to the West. A few days after the appearance of the new criminal code, a commission was established to urgently compile lists of intellectuals living in Moscow, Petrograd, and Kazan who were subject to expulsion from the country. The commission consisted of three people, the head of the Chaika, Joseph Unschlicht, People's Commissar of Justice Dmitry Kursky and Deputy Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars Lev Kamenev. When the list was compiled, the top considered it too small and ordered it to be expanded. As a result, more than a hundred counter-revolutionaries joined him. It is unclear on what principle the candidates for expulsion were selected, since the list included both outstanding world-renowned scientists and ordinary professors who simply lectured students at departments. There were also artists and a very large number of philosophers. Some of those who got on lists of literary and artistic figures were beaten off by their influential friends who stood up for them at the very top. There are even cases when people were crossed off the list and they were very happy about it, but soon they themselves began to ask to leave the country. For example, the famous writer Yevgeny Zamyatin, who was demobilized and stayed in the USSR, soon changed his mind and wanted to leave, but all his attempts were now unsuccessful. He was able to emigrate to France only 10 years later, after a letter to Stalin. Why did the people on the list, although the majority did not share the ideas of the Bolsheviks, so want to be removed from there? Firstly, many of them loved Russia and did not plan to leave it. They worked at universities and institutes, taught, engaged in scientific activities, and believed that the Bolsheviks would not stay in power for long and that soon everything would return to normal. Secondly, there were persistent rumors in Moscow and Petrograd that these lists were actually not deportation lists, but execution lists. Therefore, when all the intellectuals who were part of them were actually put on steamships and trains and taken out of Russia, they were even happy. It's a good thing they weren't sent to camps and shot. The enemies of the regime were deported along with their families. They were allowed to take a minimum of things with them, two pairs of winter and summer underwear, two shirts, one autumn and winter coat each, and so on. No personal archives or documents were allowed to be taken out of the country, jewelry also had to stay at home, and even crosses were ordered to be removed from their bodies. The intelligentsia were sent to Europe by trains from Moscow, as well as by sea vessels from Petrograd, Sevastopol, and Odessa. Interestingly, at the same time, many of the persons involved in the lists were expelled from the country first class, that is, settled in compartments and cabins of superior comfort. The list was full of respected and famous names. Among the passengers were philosophers Nikolai Berdyaev, Sergei Bulgakov, Ivan Aline, Sergei Trubetskoy, journalist Mikhail Osorjan, process engineer, steam turbine designer Vsevolod Yasinsky, and so on and so forth. The total number of deported intellectuals, according to some sources, amounted to just over 100 people, and according to others, about 300. 
Tens of billions of Soviet rubles in terms of dollars, 25 million, were spent on a campaign to expel dissidents from the USSR in the 1920s, hungry for the country. But the leader of the revolution believed that the expulsion of harmful elements from the country would then pay off by itself. The concept of a philosophical steamer was first introduced in the early 1990s by philosopher Sergei Korazim. Many historians have called this campaign itself and called it a symbolic and dramatic phenomenon. Russia is a country that produced many great scientists, writers, poets, and thinkers of the Silver Age and eventually rejected them, considering them unnecessary and even dangerous in the new Soviet coordinate system. And from a historical point of view, it benefited Europe, where all these people applied their knowledge and talents, although for each of them parting with their homeland was a personal tragedy. Nowadays, some historians have a different view of the famous and tragic fact of the expulsion of representatives of science and intellectuals from the country. There is an opinion that in such a decision of Lenin, there was no tragedy, and the deplorable consequences of this deportation for the country are exaggerated. Those who adhere to this position claim that among the specialists expelled from the USSR, only a few, for example, Berdyayev, represented real value for science and culture. Having got rid of the rest of the intelligentsia, the country, they say, has not lost anything, but it has cleansed itself of those who could sow in the people a grain of doubt about the loyalty of Lenin's course. The fact that a significant part of the passengers were philosophers, hence the name, philosophical steamer, from the point of view of these historians, only confirms the inoffensiveness of such an exile. They say that philosophy is not a particularly valuable science, especially if we take into account those harmful, anti-Bolshevik ideas that many philosophers broadcast in the early years of the formation of the young Soviet Republic. Defenders of this decision of the leader call such deportation even correct. Presumably, after weighing the potential harm and benefit, the Soviet authorities considered that these people would be more harmful to the regime. So, Trotsky spoke about this large-scale operation to expel prominent intellectuals from the country like this. They say there was no reason to shoot them but at the same time it was impossible to tolerate them. The fates of the passengers of the philosophical steamer developed in different ways, but most of them continued their scientific and teaching activities in a foreign country. For example, Nikolai Berdyayev founded the Academy of Philosophy and Religion in Berlin, which was then transferred to Paris. In France, he lectured, wrote articles, exchanged ideas with colleagues from other countries, and participated in international conferences. Sergei Trubetskoy, a Russian professor of Russian law, was a professor at the Russian law faculty and the Russian People's University in Prague. And Vsevolod Yusinsky became the first head of the Russian Scientific Institute in Berlin. After the collapse of the USSR, Russian directors Demurov and Epstein made a five-part film about the fate of the immigrated intelligentsia called Let's Not Curse Exile. In the early years of the revolution, with the mass departure of white officers, scientists, writers, entrepreneurs, and cultural figures from the Soviet country, immigration centers were immediately formed around the world, where the majority of Russians were concentrated. One of these centers was the Chinese city of Harbin, 